My name is Dr. Chris Bungai. I'm going to introduce myself, and then I'll have Dr. Savali introduce herself. I am a uh, physician from uh, New York City. Uh, I am a provider at uh, NYU Langone Health. Uh, I did grow up in the Philippines uh, until I was age 13. And I went to high school in Manila Science. And then I moved to the U.S. and finished my medical school and, and college here. And I'm now doing a lot of primary care internal medicine uh, in New York. And I'm doing a lot of HIV and prep work. Dr. Valley, want to introduce yourself? Thank you, Dr. Chris. Good morning, everyone. Welcome you all to our webinar on the topic, Ask Me About HIV and Pre-Exposure, Education for Clinicians. I am Maria Lea Lingatong Sabayle, a Doctor of Philosophy in Nursing Education, major in Leadership and Management, researcher and faculty from St. Paul University, Manila, College of Nursing and Allied Health Sciences. We are excited to bring you this important webinar today on the topic HIV and pre-exposure. Some financial relationships we have. Uh, I am a speaker for several HIV companies, including Gilead, B, uh, Merck, Janssen, and Edorsia. And Dr. Savali has no financial relationship to disclose. And this is an educational activity that is supported by uh, educational grant from Gilead Sciences. And all activity content materials have been developed by the planning committee members and the mm -hmm. faculty presenters. And some of the objectives we have today is hopefully you can identi help identify and implement HIV screening recommendations. And you can hopefully be able to look at what's contraindications to PrEPs and who's eligible for PrEPs. And hopefully be able to identify medications that are suitable for rapid initiation and describe the benefits of rapid initiation in people with HIV. Before we do that, I'm gonna start, we'll start with a pretest, and I'll have Dr. Sabali lead you to that. Okay, so we will get started. We have a few questions and please take a few moments to answer them. May I read the questions for you? Are you ready? Test if the patient consents to the HIV test. Which of the following is a contraindication to HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis? Continued injection drug use? Hepatitis B? Pregnancy, reactive HIV test, use of gender affirming hormones. Which regimen can be offered as an alternative to dolotigravir, a combination of TDF, lamivudin, for people with newly diagnosed HIV? before a baseline testing results are available. Bectigravir or Bictarv, Dolotigravir, Lamivudin or Dovato, Emtricitabin, Ralpivirin or the Complera, TDF, Lamivudin, Ralpivirin. Thank you very much for your kind participation. There are 189 people living with HIV in the Philippines by the end of 2023, as estimated by the Department of Health, Epidemiology, HIV, and AIDS Surveillance of the Philippines. 63% of the estimated people living with HIV translates to about 119, 145 have been diagnosed or laboratory confirmed and currently living or not reported to have died as of December 2023. Furthermore, 75,300 people living with HIV are currently on life-saving antiretroviral therapy or ART, 45% of which is 31,000 333, 330 people living with HIV have been tested for
for viral load in 12 months. Moreover, 88% or about 27,468 among those tested for viral load, only 36%, however, were virally suppressed. Among reasons identified by Ed, Dr. Edsel Maurice Salvania, Director, Institute of Molecular Biology and Biotechnology, National Institutes of Health, University of the Philippines, are as follows. Little awareness of prevention strategies. Only 63% knows their status. 29% of new diagnoses are of late stage. Ultimately, the stigma is still tremendous and people are reluctant to get tested and most people only agree to testing when they are symptomatic. In 2023, almost 92% of new infections occurred in key populations. The table shows the highest identified population of 693,000 are MSM, or men having sex with men. Only 28.4% got tested and aware, while the prevalence rate is at 5%. The second highest in population size of 231,000 and highest in terms of awareness are sex workers which is 66.3%. The third highest in terms of populations are transgender people. Of 207,000, only 36.3% tested and aware with a prevalence rate of 3.9%. The lowest in terms of population size are the people using injection drugs of 7,300. 26.9% got tested and aware, but with highest prevalence rate of 29%. Therefore, sex workers are the most aware and tested populations, while HIV is most prevalent on people using drugs. The pie graph shows that the lion's share of 85% of HIV transmission is through MSM, followed by 12% heterosexual, then vertical. Persons who inject drugs having the least HIV mode of transmission. Based on the green line graph, the global HIV prevalence rate has been declining from about 2.5 million in the year 2000 to below 15,000 in 2023. Meanwhile, in the Philippines, there is 411% uptick from the year 2012 to 2023, as seen in the red line graph. Hence, HIV is currently categorized as fastest growing epidemic in the country. Dr. Chris will present the HIV testing, prevention and treatment. Thank you, Dr. Sabali. Thank you for giving us a background on what it's like in the Philippines so we have an idea why we are doing what we do. So if we go on to the next slide here, we'll talk about HIV testing. There is a concept that we use a lot in the U.S. I'm not sure if it's common worldwide. We call U equals U. That means if you're undetectable, that means untransmittable. We have a lot of data showing that if someone is undetectable, it's very hard for them to transmit the HIV to someone else. So we're trying to use this to help destigmatize HIV and also to help destigmatize HIV testing. So what we have here is an algorithm here. If someone gets tested for HIV, either you test negative or you test positive. If you test negative, maybe perhaps that's a chance for you to offer those patients a prevention treatment 
people uh, so they don't become HIV positive and let them continue participating in that medication, whatever you decide uh, to use for prevention and to try to reduce their risk for HIV and keep getting them tested. Now, if someone does test positive, you can offer treatment, especially we have a lot of medications now where we can use what we call rapid start where well, you can start treatment right away. You don't have to wait for lab results. So you can get them engaged in treatment right away. And we'll talk more about that down the road uh, in, a few, in a few slides. And uh, there's a way to retention in care and suppress their virus right away. So they become undetectable faster and therefore and transmittable to other patients. And again, the key here is to destigmatize HIV testing and also people who do test positive, we can destigmatize them by getting treatment right away. Uh, a lot of what happens to those people who do get infected? Um, this is the data in the U.S. that shows almost about 40 percent of them were unaware that their, that their sexual partners are unaware of their infection. They're unaware that they had HIV and about a small percentage of them had probably had acute infection. They were infected recently. But there are only 60% uh, of people who do are aware that they do have HIV. Some of them, unfortunately, are not in care. And some of them are in care, but unfortunately, they're not suppressed. A small, only a small percentage of people. So it's almost like 40% of people were not aware that they had HIV when they, when they uh, of their sexual partners when they get infected. So there's definitely, we have a lot of work to do to prevent people from getting infected. Uh, so who are the key po pa uh, patient populations we should focus on? who do are getting infected. As you saw the data earlier, the big number of them is still the men who have sex with men. You have transgender women. You have people who are sex workers and people who use injection drugs. So perhaps these are the key populations we have to focus on in getting uh, tested and more frequently. And there are definitely a lot of community-based HIV screening. And once you increase, once you get them screened, it's just, we just don't stop there. We, that's just because they are negative. We don't want to stop. If they're negative, we want to link them to prevention. So that means perhaps preventive medication for HIV. Or if they are positive, we will link them to treatment and care and support. And that should be offered to all those people, especially in the key population. Hopefully, there's also an option for self-testing so for those people in those populations. So they, they don't have to perhaps see a provider to get tested. Perhaps they can get tested through some over-the-counter testing or something that they don't need a provider for testing for. And then these are the different HIV testing that we should offer to anybody, uh, really pretty much a lot of people. It's looking at people who perhaps are there for uh, they're pregnant or for postnatal care, uh, people who might have tuberculosis. There's a high also incidence of people with TB who may have coexisting HIV. Uh, again, the key populations that we discussed earlier. People who are coming into you for just STI testing or HIV testing, uh, those are the people definitely you want to offer. You don't want to re uh, refuse to test those people who are coming in voluntarily for testing. Uh, people who might be there for reproductive health and wellness or someone who might have a viral hepatitis, uh, they're also perhaps at risk for uh, HIV as well, not just for the hepatitis that they've obtained. And adolescents are usually more sexually active, so those things you probably want to offer to your adolescents if you're working in an clinic. So it should really be offered to a lot of people, and especially if they have a partner who has HIV, that's pretty obvious, or perhaps their partner has a risk as well for getting HIV. And just a reminder, parental consent is not required for adolescents if they're 15 and older. You don't need to get a consent from their parents. Uh, you, you could test them if they're 15 or older. Uh, this, uh, but you should consent everybody. Uh, we call it informed consent uh, if you are testing them for HIV. So we'll talk about HIV prevention next. What are the different options we have? This is what we call PrEP. If you're not aware of the definition, uh, PrEP means... Uh, pre-exposure uh, prophylaxis. So meaning you, they, people take medications before they get exposed to HIV. And we have so many studies now that show the risk of HIV acquisition through PrEP has been reduced by almost 100%. There's not too many medications we can say that. Like 99%, if patients take it regularly, the risk of them getting HIV is really, really low. Uh, and then people who do injection drugs also, they've shown that at least 74% risk reduction. So we this medication really, really works. But we got to remember, this does not work for STIs. This only works for HIV. So we still have to counsel our patients, 
uh, not just for safe sex counseling, but the risk of getting STIs. So we do recommend people who are sexually active, if they are in PrEP, to get tested for STIs regularly because this is, they're not protected from that. So these are very, very effective medication. Uh, this is the who will benefit from PrEP. So sometimes it's very obvious. Sometimes it may not. So those, of course, who are exposed to HIV could be people that we talked about earlier, those key populations, the MSM, transgender, sex workers, people who use injection drugs, and then people who may have sex with people who are living with HIV who is not biologically suppressed and their viral load is unknown. So those are what we call zero discordant couples, uh, meaning one person is positive, one person is negative, and they may not know what the uh, viral load of their partner. People who do condomless sex or unprotected sex in the past six months months with more than one partner. And this is the very obvious one. If someone's coming into you with an STI in the past six months, those are your patients that are high risk for STIs. Multiple studies have shown that. So if someone's coming to you with an STI, that's your clue. Something There's a reason why they got an STI. So those are their risk factors as well for getting HIV. I always say STI and HIV, they travel together. So those are the people who are going to benefit from PrEP. People may tell you they use sex enhancing drugs or injecting equipment in the last six months, or people might have been already uh, in, in the US, we have what we call post-exposure prophylaxis, where someone they think they might get infected with HIV and they go on medications for a month to prevent getting HIV. Those also potentially are your patients who might be at risk for getting HIV. And of course, people who have sexual partner with one or more HIV risk factors and people who are requesting for PrEP. Those, they may not tell you why they're requesting PrEP. They may not be uh, willing to open up why they uh, they want to go on PrEP, but those are your kind of clues to say, oh, maybe you will benefit. So never deny somebody who's requesting PrEP to go on PrEP. Uh, because and also because they're not just for them, but who they're having sex with, right? Those are also the the risk factors from getting HIV. It's not not just for their who they're having sex with, but who those person are having other sex with other people as well. What are your different options for prep? Uh, in the U.S., we have two oral options and one injectable options at the moment. These are your two oral options. One is Trivada. One is Discovery. Trivada has been around. It's been approved since 2012. It is approved if your cranial clearance is more than 60. And there is a slight risk for people who are developing kidney or bone toxicity. It has been studied as well in Europe for what we call 211, we call on-demand use. So they only take it when they know they can predict when they're going to have sex. So sometimes that can be very helpful for people who don't have sex frequently, uh, and perhaps they can only take it as needed. Uh, and it's been approved for men and women and transgender women. And there is a generic equivalent in the U.S. and a lot of other countries, so the cost is a lot less. And then there's Discovy that has been approved in the U.S. in 2019. It's a lot more forgiving because of there's less toxicity for the bone and the kidneys. So it's actually approved for creating clearance for 30 or more. Uh, there is, this is debatable. There's some, some studies have shown there's a slight increase in LDL and weight, but we don't actually, a lot of providers actually don't believe that. Uh, it's just that Trivada causes decrease in LDL and weight, but Discovy does not. So it's actually weight neutral and LDL neutral. But when you compare with Trivada, there is a slight increase when you go from Trivada to Discovy. So that's actually a debatable question there. Uh, it is unfortunately not studied for people, especially for cisgender women, who may get HIV through vaginal sex. Right now, there is a trial undergoing to study this. So right now, it's only approved for MSM and transgender women, but not for cisgender women. And hopefully, in a year or two, we'll, we'll get um, more information about this. It is approved for people who weigh more than 35 kilogram, and it is a smaller pill than Trivada. And then our third option in the next slide will be an injectable prep, which has been approved only the last couple of years here in the US. It is approved for uh, all at-risk patients, MSM, transgender women, cisgender women, as long as they weigh more than 35 kilograms. There's very minimal drug drug interactions. Only some of the old anticonvulsants are you can't use this medication and rifampin. Uh, some of the common side effects includes injection site reactions because they are getting a needle. It's an injectable prep that they receive every two months. First, we usually give a patient a the medication, and then a month later, we give them a booster shot, and then after that, we give it every two months. If someone who might be sensitive to a lot of drugs, we do have the option we call an oral lead-in. So if someone can take the medicine for a month, an oral version of the shot, 
so they can see if they develop an allergic reaction. And if they're fine, then they can continue with the shot. It is optional. We don't use too often, but it is available in case someone is concerned about potential side effect. So let's go on to the um, to the next one here. Like I said, who may benefit from PrEP? Uh, and then who will not? But I can tell you, if someone who is pregnant or breastfeeding, they can still use PrEP. If they have hepatitis B infection, they can still use PrEP. If they use injection drugs, they can use PrEP. And if they are on gender affirming almonds, they can use PrEP. So just a lot of people can use PrEP, except if they have a reactive HIV test, of course. Or if you suspect someone might have a recent HIV seroconversion, I uh, said so that's the only contraindication to PrEP. What is this recent HIV seroconversion? As a reminder, if you're not aware, some of the symptoms that someone feel if they did get HIV recently, usually happens two to four weeks after exposure. They may have a flu-like signs and symptoms like sore throat, swollen lymph nodes, and body aches. Kind of similar to flu or COVID, right? So it's another, it's like a virus. So some, if someone you suspect might have been exposed recently, you might want to test more, you might want to test them again, or maybe do a special test to make sure they don't have what's called acute retroviral syndrome, because this is a, a lot of this medication is a, it's a partial treatment for HIV. So if you're only giving a partial treatment for HIV and they do have HIV, that's when things can get into a problem. So you want to make sure they're really negative. So you want to make sure you might want to test them again to make sure you're negative, or you might want to order other tests that can detect early HIV infection. So let's talk about HIV treatment. Let's go on to the next slide here and one more. Uh, so we talked about same day treatment earlier. Um, that really is just a new concept for a lot of people, but we've been using it for a lot for the last uh, couple, three, four years. And the idea of this is you wanna start somebody, hopefully within the same day, once you know that they have, uh, they test positive for HIV. And because um, there's definitely a lot of benefits we will talk about in a minute here. Uh, the only thing you wanna consider is um, definitely if someone who may have underlying uh, infection like tuberculosis, meningitis, cryptococcal meningitis, CMV, retinitis. And sometimes they can develop what's called immunity constitution syndrome. So for those people, you might want to delay it a little bit. But it has been shown people who do start treatment early, that it does reduce the risk of mortality for those people who have an opportunity of infection. But sometimes you want to Sometimes they do get worse if you start them early. So if you do have underlying uh, conditions, like I mentioned here, you might want to wait a little bit to make sure their T cells are okay before you start them on medication. So we'll go on to the next slide here. Uh, these are the uh, guidelines for the U.S. Uh, when you initiate uh, someone with HIV right away, before you even see any results, sometimes it's really a hard concept sometimes for some people. You usually, when you diagnose with HIV, you order all this blood tests and then you start them on medicines once they come back. But now we can actually start them on medicine before even waiting for those results to come back. There are three medications that we use regularly in the US. One's called Victarbi, uh, the other one is uh, uh, Dolotegravir plus either TAF, TDF, uh, or Lamidabin or Imtrizabine. So it depends which which version you want, uh, or a boosted protease inhibitor as well. You can use those because you know that you can get um, these medications without waiting for the results to come back, that they will work. They will work. These, are these are the only medications we know will work for patients uh, without waiting for the results. Uh, the only exception is if they were on PrEP before. If they were on uh, the, in, the injectable PrEP, especially cabotegravir, uh, the only one we have is cabotegravir PrEP, is you cannot use the first two. You have to use the boosted darunavir, that's the protease inhibitor, because they may be resistant to what we call the integrase inhibitor. And since the first two have integrase inhibitor, you have to use the protease inhibitor, which is the boosted darunavir. Fortunately, in the Philippines, you have another option. Uh, that is the uh, single tablet regimen of dolotegravir TDF lamivudine. We actually do not have this available in the U.S., but it is available as a single tablet regimen that you can also use as well uh, for uh, for a rapid start. Just that's why there's all those different options on the second bullet there. All right, let's go on to the next one. Uh, why do we want to do rapid treatment? Uh, so what's the definition, first of all? You want to make sure uh, you get someone treated within seven days of HIV diagnosis. That's pretty short for a lot of places. Sometimes that's very difficult. But seven days is the ideal. So hopefully by the time you see them, 
put, by the time you send them to the lab, you get them started on medications right away, uh, even the same day that you see them. Uh, and then especially someone who has advanced HIV disease, you want to get them started right away as long as they're not feeling sick. Why is that? There's been so many uh, studies that shown there is an increased retention to care if you do start somebody uh, in uh, HIV medication. People come back to you when they know that you care enough to start them on medication. So that's when you tell them, well, come back in a month or two. Let's get started later. Let's wait for your T cells to come back down. Guess what? People don't come back. So that retention and care is not there. There's been benefits after all. If you start somebody in treatment right away, they will come back. And guess what? Not only that, they preserve their immune function. Their T cells never drop low enough. You don't wait till the T cells to drop. So their immune system stays preserved. And therefore, that decreases their mobility and mortality. The risk of getting infections or even cancer gets less if you preserve their immune system. And not only that, once you get them to undetectable fast, we talked about U equals U. Therefore, they're not transmittable to other people. So there's so many benefits to starting someone right away. So we really advocate for that now uh, because we do have medicines that work with that for rapid treatment. Unlike before, we did not have a lot of medicines to do that. We have to wait for lab results. That is no longer the case. Now we have all those different options. So next slide, please. We'll talk about what medication, what kind of testing do you do? This is what we recommend in the U.S. It might be different from place to place. Uh, this is pretty standard, I think, for a lot of places, uh, and I think this might be common to you guys as well. We look for T cell count, we look for viral load, we look for their CBC or the complete blood count, their chemistries, their liver function, kidney functions. We make sure that they don't have underlying hepatitis A, B, and C. And if they, if you are considering a back of ear, which is not part of the rapid uh, medication, uh, you want to might want to do the HLA B testing for to make sure that they're able to take that drug. But since we are advocating for rapid start, that is not one of them. And then we do a baseline genotype in case we do might have to change their regimen down the road. At least we know what works for them. But again, we do not have to wait for all these test results to come back before starting them on medication, since I just mentioned to you all the benefits of having that. Well, let's see how much you listened. Let's do some post-test. I know I spoke too fast. <laughs> Hopefully you understood most of the things that I mentioned. And then let's test to see how you're doing. So let's roll the test. And this will be the same questions I asked you earlier. And we'll be, uh, Dr. Savaya asked you earlier. And we can see if there's any change in your answers, perhaps. And let's see how let's test your knowledge base. Let's go on to the question, please. OK, so uh, at this juncture, let us again, according to Dr. Bungay, let us revisit some of the polling questions we asked at the beginning of the program. Okay, so let us begin. Question number one. Which of the following best described HIV testing recommendations for a 42-year-old patient with syphilis? Test if the patient has signs or symptoms of acute retroviral syndrome. Test if the patient is a man who has sex with men. Test if the patient consents to the HIV test. Move on to question number two. Which of the following is a contraindication to HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis? Continued injection drug use, hepatitis B, pregnancy, reactive HIV test, use of gender-affirming hormones. Question number three. This is the last question. Which regimen can be offered as an alternative to dolotigravir, TDF, lamivudine for people with newly diagnosed HIV before baseline testing results are available? Bictigravir, TF, TAF, FTC, or the Bictarv, Dolotigravir, Lamivudin, or the Duvato, m 3 c Tabin, Relpivirin, TDF, or the Cumplera, TDF, or Lamivudin plus Relpivirin. Thank you very much.
So which of the following best describes HIV testing recommendation for cerebral syphilis? So really what we want here is, um, is the, it's just the consent. It doesn't matter if they had uh, signs or symptoms. It doesn't matter if they're having sex with men, because as we know, not everybody uh, who tests positive for HIV have sex with, or our men have sex with men. Uh, and it doesn't matter if they can access it. I think anybody who consents to it, we should basically recommend testing. That will help reduce that stigma that we talked about. And then the second question, which is the contraindication to HIV uh, PrEP? Um, not, definitely someone who has a positive HIV test should not be on PrEP because they should be on HIV treatment instead. All the others is not a contraindication. They can go in PrEP if they have all those. And the last question is, which regimen can be offered as an alternative if someone, if, for example, if you're not in the Philippines and you don't have this option of dalitegravir, uh, TDF, and lamidabine, and the only ones that you can really use is Pictarvi in this option. Devaro is not approved for somebody, for someone who, without waiting for the results of your lab results, same thing with Complera, and same thing with the TDF, lamidabine, and Rifibrine. So the only one you can use, those three options that I mentioned earlier, either Pictarvi or um, the uh, the Tegravir TDF TAP with 3TC or FTC, or the boosted uh, the Runavir. Those are the three things that we use for rapid start. Let's talk about questions the, from the audience. So Dr. I think Kumar, we have questions already here. I think yep. you can, I know, uh, if you can. Um... Sure. So let's talk about the first question here. Can HIV be transmitted through blood transfusion? If the individual is undergoing treatment, is undetectable and transmittable. Very interesting question. I don't think we know the answer. Uh, fortunately, I think probably not. And we do a lot of good testing now for HIV for the blood donations we receive. So fortunately, this has not been an issue for quite a while now. But chances are probably they are not transmittable. But we don't know the answer. And then another question here. We are an era already where we have the resources and advances in terms of laboratory types, equipment, and advances in research studies. Why do you think that still up to this moment, we don't, still don't have a cure or vaccine for HIV? We always ask this question. Uh, it's a it's a retro act. It's, it's, it's because of the, the, the nature of the virus. Uh, it hides very well. It really is very hard to find a cure. It's not like any other viruses that we have. It's almost similar to, I would equate to a cold virus. We get cold virus all the time because they do mutate regularly uh, and they do change. So we don't, it's not very easy to find a cure with this type of virus. So unfortunately, um, that's the reason why, but research is still ongoing. They're looking at all different ways to uh, to find vaccines or cure, and hopefully sometime in our lives uh, in our lifetime that can happen. But because it's a very different virus to work with, it's not like other viruses like hepatitis C, uh, where we do have cures, and some other viruses where we do have medicines. Unfortunately, it's one of those medicines that it's one of those viruses that is chronic, and they do change, and it's not easy to find a cure and uh, and vaccine, but. There's hope, so let's not give up on that. Dr. Bungay? Yes. There's a question there, and it can be answered by you, I think. Sure. Factors are important to consider when selecting an HIV regimen. What factors to consider? Uh, first of all, uh, it depends on what's available uh, in your area. That's definitely one factor. And... We have a lot of drugs that are easier. Basically, something might be like one pill once a day is a big factor for a lot of my patients. Uh, it's something that uh, easier for them to remember. Uh, some patients who have comorbidities, they may have diabetes, hypertension, and you might want to consider some of their medication, make sure they don't interact with their medication. And also perhaps that it uh, doesn't make their underlying condition worse. So those are all the different factors. And then plus to mention the fact when we talked about starting someone early. So we do have some of those drugs that we do start early. Who well, fortunately, a lot of those drugs we could use despite underlying comorbidities, underlying medications, 
So, but those are the reasons why there are certain drugs that you can only take with food. There are certain drugs that you can only take a certain time of the day. And we want our patients to be successful. We want them to do well. We want them to not have any burden with their medication. So we try to choose drugs that will work with their schedule, that would work with their underlying condition, that hopefully they can take with or without food, they can take anytime. And the biggest factor of all is drugs that we I would call high barrier to resistance. So meaning that even if you miss a drug for like a few hours or even for a day, that that drug will continue to work. We have a lot of drugs now that we call the high barrier resistance where even if, because they have a long half-life, they can take their drug and still miss by a few hours and it will still work, they'll be fine. Uh, so that's very hard. We don't tell our patients that, but the, we still try to tell them, take it as long as you can, as, op, as, as, as on time as you can. But when they freak out and say, I miss my drug, what's gonna happen? Will I fail? You can reassure them, no, this drug is very forgiving. You're gonna be fine. So for me, that is the biggest uh, factor for choosing a drug. Okay, so there's a follow-up question on that, Dr. Chris. What are the common side effects of the current treatments for HIV? That keeps changing. <laughs> In the past, we've had a lot of drugs that have a lot of side effects. But the ones we have now, the ones that we talked some about today, really very, very minimal. We're talking based on clinical trials, Less than 5% of people may perhaps may have nausea, may have diarrhea, and they perhaps they may feel tired for a few days. But a lot of those side effects are very minimal. And not only that, they go away after a few days. The most I've ever seen was two weeks, maybe a month, the longest, one, once in a while. But they're really self-limited. Okay, so um, there's another question. I think, Dr. Bungay, about mm. HIV regimen. The question goes, what makes certain regimens such as uh, Bictagravir, TAF, FTC, or Dolotigravir, TDF, or Lamivudin more appropriate for rapid initiation? Yes. So we didn't talk about that earlier. The reason why it's more appropriate for some medication is because of what's in the community. We want to see what drugs have what we call high percentage of people who may be resistant to a component of the drug. And then there are drugs that are also that have we call high barrier to resistance, meaning they're forgiving if you miss certain drugs. So those are the drugs that we mentioned earlier that have those, meaning they have high barrier to resistance. And if their the resistance pattern in the community is not showing a high percentage of those resistance to the component of the drugs. So therefore we can be reassured that that patient will do well with that medicine if they try it without even waiting for the lab results. Hey, thank you so much, Dr. Bungay. Mm -hmm. Another one, can you get HIV someone who is using pre-exposure prophylaxis who just had sex with an HIV positive person it's never 100%. So the the answer to the question is, yes, it can. But the chances are it's very rare, not very common. Um, if you are taking your PrEP regularly, the chance of failing PrEP is very, very small. We're talking about less than 1%. The only other time sometimes people can fail, if for some reason, perhaps the person who they're having sex with who's HIV positive may have a viral load that is maybe not detectable or perhaps they have resistance to the component of the drug that the person has on PrEP on. So they may become resistant to that. So therefore that could potentially, uh, people could potentially get infected. But we're looking here at less than 1%. And studies, has been, PrEP has been around for 10 years. We've only seen this in a very handful, small handful of patients. So it's, if someone takes their medication regularly, it's really, really hard for someone to get infected, we're talking less than 1%. Okay, so I think this will be the last question. What would be the required viral load for those who want to be undetectable uh, in IV? <laughs> yes, so that changes from lab to lab. In the US, we use 20 as the cutoff as undetectable. But really what it comes down to it, because sometimes people, we, we have what we call blips, 
where the, 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 the lab is so sensitive that you may actually have a viral load, but it's not nothing to do with you missing the medicine. So we call those blips and we don't we can't explain them. Uh, so what we really look into if their viral load is less than 200, they truly are undetectable and untransmittable. It's really rare for to someone to transmit if you have viral load less than 200. And there is another more question, Dr. Bungay. Mm -hmm. How can we break the stigma behind HIV testing? That is a million dollar question. Uh, it really comes down to how often we do this and make it as part of a primary care. We test people for diabetes. We test people for blood pressure. It should be the same reason why you test for HIV. It's a primary care issue. I think someone who, men, the, the men actually have to be at risk of HIV. If we offer HIV testing to everybody, just like the way we offer blood pressure testing or diabetes testing, there would be no stigma with HIV testing. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Bungay. And thank you to our participants. Again, thank you very much for gracing this webinar. And thank you for all your questions and your attention.